When Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition was announced, I immediately went out and pre-ordered it on my Switch. I have fond memories of playing this game from my teenage years, but I was never able to finish it because my 360, my Xbox 360 had the Red Ring of Death. That said, I don't really remember much of Vesperia. It was one of the first Tales games to be released on the sixth generation of consoles, debuting on the 360 and later releasing on the PS3 with some bonus content. This game is like 10 years old, so I guess the main question that I have is, does Tales of Vesperia really hold up? Am I blinded by my rose-tinted nostalgia goggles? Well, let's rip that bandaid off and take a look at Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition on Nintendo Switch. And a quick note or warning, I am going to talk about the story here. I'm not going to spoil anything super major, but uh, there will be some gameplay footage and I will be covering elements through like the first half of the game or so. Th that's one of the monsters that attacked Halor! As with most Tales games, Vesperia is a standalone experience, but the world it takes place in has its own history and lore. That's always one of the things that you know, it takes a while for me to get used to. You're thrown into this huge, expansive world and they start throwing out made up terms like Blastia, Aircrene, and this monstrosity of a word. By the end of the intro cutscene, I'm just sitting there trying to comprehend everything, wondering how they came up with so many made up words. It kind of actually reminds me of Final Fantasy 13. Now, I'm not gonna get too in depth with the lore or the background of the world because honestly, all you need to know is that there are these little orbs called Blastia and these are used as a power source. They are pretty much the focal point of the world. Everything revolves around Blastia, and humanity depends on them much like we depend on energy in real life. One of the most common functions of Blastia is to create a shield around a town to prevent monsters from uh, you know, running in and destroying innocent townsfolk. But they can also be imbued onto people, granting combat prowess and abilities. As to the origin of the Blastia, well, that's for us to find out. Luckily, Vesperia does a fantastic job at explaining the terminology, mythos, and consequences of your actions throughout the story. And here we have our purple-haired protagonist. This is Yuri. Yuri is kind of a jerk in that Han Solo way. You know, he's this dashing, roguish guy who happens to be good at picking fights, but he'll also sacrifice himself for other people at the drop of a hat. He has a strong personal code that he adheres to, and that's kind of what makes him interesting throughout this game because that code is challenged time and time again, and you get to see how he reacts and changes as a character. Yuri lives in the lower quarter of Zafius, the capital city, with his dog, Repeat. Yep, Yuri's best friend is a big purple wolf, and Repeat is awesome. I love the sound effects that he makes. <laughs> when the Blastia core that protects the lower quarter is stolen, all the people who live there are put in danger. Yuri makes it his mission to find out just who exactly stole the Blastia and teach the thief a lesson. It's a fairly simple premise that is admittedly elementary, but it does a great job at not only building up the tension, but easing into a larger adventure and developing the cast. The first main party member you find is Estelle, a young lady from the capital's castle. Her motivations are kind of unclear and kept vague at first, you know, she's pretty much the perfect embodiment of that naive princess trope. She never worked a day in her life and she's just generally unaware of how people live outside the castle. Yuri and Estelle meet very early on in the game, while Yuri is escaping his incarceration for beating up a couple guards, and Estelle is escaping the castle for unrelated reasons, I guess? It sure leaves a lot of questions, especially to new players. But nevertheless, Yuri and Estelle team up. It's a good thing too, because Estelle knows how to heal, and the beginning of this game can be pretty tough. You can heal in battle with items, but there are only a limited number of items you can pick up in the early game, so it's awesome to have Estelle in your party. Party members will come and go throughout the adventure, but we gotta talk about Man's best friend, Rapide. He's a pretty persistent party member, but he doesn't really do much, to be honest. I mean, he's a dog. My favorite thing about him is that he's a dog, and dogs are awesome. Hazard, come here, bud. Come here. Come on. Who is that dude bark? The voice actor for Rapide sounds like a guy they just hired off the street to bark into a microphone for a day. <laughs> Oh, and you could also go snowboarding with him, or dress him up in a number of costumes, including Santa Claus. So yeah, that's a thing that exists. The other characters you meet during your journey are distinct and memorable. I really like how nobody's ever forgotten and they each have their own motivations, fears, and secrets. Sometimes in RPGs, you'll have someone join your party, but they end up never saying anything or interacting with the rest of the group, especially during critical story moments. Octopath was the last game I played that did this, which I thought was an unfortunate detriment to the game. Even other long-standing franchises like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and many more are guilty of this. 
In Vesperia, a lot of characters will chime in during events or even help progress the story forward by proposing ideas on where to go. For example, you'll party up with a mage named Rita who has an unnatural fascination and love with Blastia. She'll frequently help explain why Blastia are reacting to certain things, and she helps answer some of the questions or directs our party where we need to go. Most characters are like this, and I really do like the interactions between them. The first half of the game will throw a lot of curveballs at you, and you have characters joining and leaving constantly, only for them to show up later. My favorite character would probably be Yuri because he's so complex, but if I had to pick another, that honor would go to Estelle or Judith. There were a lot of moments I noticed while playing, particularly at the beginning of the game, that I would consider deus ex machina, or at least just really, really convenient explanations. For example, the party will have a problem of some sort, and then something will magically happen to progress the story forward and tell you where to go. Like, oh, thank you, giant dragon, for coming to my aid when I needed it. Oh, thank you, really strong guy, for protecting me from that boss which I had just defeated. Thanks, old man, for suddenly saving us from these soldiers. There was one section where I killed a boss, and then in the cutscene directly after, my party is acting like they're losing and dying. It's like, what? No, no, that guy was easy. I just killed him. Stop. Despite all the cheesy moments in, in the story, um, there are some sections and cutscenes that are done really well that just kind of left my jaw hanging open. Like, what? Did he really just do that? Oh my god. Overall, it takes a bit to get going, and the high points definitely outweigh the low points. There are even some animated cutscenes that look really cool. It takes me back to 13-year-old Taco playing Symphonia, being impressed at the cutscenes. Also, this game is long AF. It's like a minimum 40-hour game. More like 60 if you go through at a casual pace like me. Let's talk about the battle system. This being a Tales game, it uses the same battle system that was used in older Tales games like Symphonia, and from my understanding, a variation of this system is even used in newer releases. It's a lot more finicky than I remembered though, so I'll do my best to explain what I like about it and what drives me absolutely insane. Essentially, you run into an enemy, you go to a small battlefield that you could run around. By default, you're locked onto your enemy and you move around on a 2D plane, similar to a fighting game. You can hold one of the trigger buttons to allow for free 360-degree uh, movement. When you approach an enemy, you have a few options, but usually you use your basic attack or an art. Arts are basically the special skills that you get from either leveling up, using arts enough to become proficient in them, or from equipment. You'll be using both of these buttons very often because it's possible to chain attacks to create really long and impressive combos. One thing I realized immediately is that this feels like a very archaic version of the Tails battle system, despite only being released 10 years ago. I don't think I was the only one that was interested in this game for nostalgia's sake, but some of these systems were definitely covered by nostalgia goggles. If you're like me, and you played on the default semi-auto battle mode at first, it's absolutely critical that you don't button mash your way through battles, and you have to wait for each and every animation to finish, or else Yuri will not be doing what you want. An example, if you're standing some distance away from your enemy and you press the attack button, Yuri will run up to the enemy before attacking. This is really, really confusing at first, because it will seem like Yuri runs around on his own, just as the semi-auto implies. If you really want to start using combos and obliterating enemies, you need to switch to manual mode. Manual mode gives you more control over Yuri and stops his auto run shenanigans. And for some reason, it feels like it's easier to chain attacks together in manual mode. Once you get some practice in, you'll be able to chain all sorts of combos and even incorporate free running into your attacks. There are mechanics that aren't really explained properly or at all, such as guard canceling and dash attacks. I highly recommend watching some videos online of how to properly battle and incorporating specific skills and guard canceling into your strategies against enemies. At the beginning of Tales of Vesperia, the battles do not feel good at all. At the beginning of the game, you don't have a lot of attacks besides your basic attack and an art or two. It feels like a game from the PS2 generation, if that makes any sense. Like you're fighting the stiffness of the controls in battle and then, oops, you jumped over an enemy because you pressed the joystick up slightly too high. And yes, I realize that my complaints about the battle controls are hard to imagine, and I'm sure the footage on screen doesn't exactly, you know, do my argument any favors, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. When I played Tales of Zestiria, I didn't really have this problem, and the controls felt significantly more responsive. Another thing that was frustrating was the beginning of the game. On the standard difficulty, you're kind of just thrown into the first few fights without a solid explanation, and if I hadn't had at least some familiarity with the franchise and the engine, I would have been extremely frustrated and not really compelled to continue at all. The worst example of this, in my opinion, is the first boss. This guy is a pain in the ass to the 10th degree. 
He does a lot of damage and he doesn't give you a moment to breathe at all. In order to defeat this guy, I had to kite him around for most of the battle while occasionally firing off a projectile. He could do this kick that knocks you down and then he'll be able to wombo combo you as soon as you stand up if you're unlucky. It's very difficult. Godspeed if you decide to play this game on hard mode. I was watching a buddy of mine play on hard mode and he died probably about 10 times to this guy, the very first boss, because the game doesn't do a good job at explaining how to kill him or how to even battle properly. Let's talk about the enemies real fast. There are a staggering amount of enemies in Vesperia and a lot of them are unique to certain areas and then a few are just simple recolors. It's actually very impressive. You could use an item called a magic lens to fill out your Pokedex at Battle log, sorry, which lets you view every model and see stats and basic information about an enemy. They range from chunks of ice to wolves to giant praying mantises to... Is that a Zamtrios? A flying Zamtrios? Oh my god. So there are two things with the enemies that drive me up the wall in Vesperia. The first is flying enemies. I hate flying enemies in Vesperia with a passion because sometimes they're up too high to hit with a normal attack. They're not hard to hit per se, but you just have to use your upward attack and the right art. But it feels like a crapshoot when your teammates try to hit them. My teammates consistently missed aerial enemies throughout the entire adventure. It was so annoying. There was one battle where my character, my player character was knocked out and the AI party was battling some basic flying enemies, but they couldn't hit it at all. We ended up game overing because Apparently, when a bird flies two meters off the ground, it requires the precision of a goddamn NASA engineer to hit. It's like, what are you doing? Hit the stupid bird. The second thing about enemies that I can't stand, and this is probably a bit more of a personal opinion, but it's when enemies get knocked to the ground. When you attack enemies, they'll often get knocked down and become vulnerable. Sure, that's great, except this does two things. They have an extremely long invulnerability period when they're on the ground, and while they're standing up. This means that you and your party will miss attacks until the enemy has finished their stand-up animation at which your combos can continue. This is extremely frustrating, beyond frustrating, because you can't continue your combos when enemies get knocked down unless they get hit with attack that sets them back to standing. Maybe there's a way to deal with this, but it is it is maddening to see your combo get canceled because one of your AI teammates knocked the enemy down and you can't hit him until it stands back up like seven seconds later. Now I know I just made it seem like battling sucks and it does in the beginning of the game. That's only the beginning though. As you start to unlock new party members and arts, the complexities of the battle system are revealed and you see just how much finesse is required to play effectively. This is when I really started to enjoy finding new enemies to fight and boss battles were extremely challenging throughout the entire game. When you come to a boss battle, you know shit is about to get real. That flying Zamtrios I mentioned earlier, he was he was real f hard. I ended up using like eight revives just to beat him on normal mode. Then there are these optional bosses that could really ruin your day, like this guy. I had to come back later to finish him off. One thing I really like is as you level up and use your arts more often, you'll end up learning brand new arts or even combinations of arts that you already know. This is where the game really starts to open up because you're able to combo different attacks and really shut down your opponents if you get a little lucky. To go along with that feel good nature, you're also graded in every single battle on the loot screen. Your grade is based on things like the amount of times you were hit, if you blocked attacks, how fast you were able to win, if you used items, etc. It might seem like grade isn't useful at all, but once you finish the game, you're able to access a grade shop to get special bonuses and effects. You can't even see the grade that you've built up until the game is over, so it's, it's really a surprise. The combat takes a while to get used to, it doesn't have the subtle improvements from newer Tales games, but I do understand why Tales continued to use this style. It was a very effective foundation for them to build off of and tweak. Inventory management is rough. There's no sort button for equipment, just an optimize equipment button. This is good, but you'll spend a lot of extra time in the menus because there are skills tied to equipment. There are hundreds of these skills, and they're mostly passive effects, such as increasing your health, attack power, altering existing arts, reducing the cost of spells, etc. By participating in battles with equipment, you'll eventually learn these skills, but if you're looking for a specific skill, you have to spend your time going through all of your weapons. 
You can also synthesize your weapons into new equipment at shops, so you're kind of encouraged just to keep everything, which makes going through your list of equipment extremely tedious. By the time you're halfway through, you'll have a ton of weapons to go through, and if you want certain weapon skills equipped, you'll be spending a lot of time in menus. The graphics, at least on the Switch, are serviceable. Uh, the game runs at 60 FPS in battle, which is fine, but in the overworld, the frame rate is capped at 30, yet it feels much more sluggish than it should. There's noticeable stutter, like there's frame timing problems or something. Another really weird and awkward thing about the visual fidelity are the cutscenes. For some reason, the depth of field is all out of whack. The foreground characters will be in focus, but anything behind them is blurred beyond belief, and it looks bad. I don't know if this is a byproduct of the original Xbox 360 version, but man, it could be distracting. Thankfully, the audio fares a little bit better for the most part. Music is great, except for one goofy track that likes to play in specific cutscenes when people tell jokes. I don't know why this track angers me, but it is overplayed and just doesn't fit with the rest of the game. The vocals are actually really good though. Yuri is voiced by Troy Baker. He does an excellent job as usual. Many of the other cast members are good enough, although some of them, like this child, and his name's Carol, are pretty whiny and high pitched. Same with the pirate girl, but definitely bearable. There is Japanese audio for those that prefer it as well. In the first draft of this video, I also touched upon some problems that I ran into concerning the audio mixing but recently there has been an update that fixed the subpar audio mixing in specific movie scenes. Uh, just as an example, the sound effects would be too loud, too quiet, or just missing altogether while something exciting is happening. It was really jarring because usually it was like Yuri just staring at something for a solid six or seven seconds and I'm just wondering like, uh, what's going on? This has been largely fixed. Also, before the update, it was way too easy to jump in battle. This latest patch tweaked the sensitivity of jumping, which really helps. I really appreciate that the developers were able to push out a solid patch to fix these issues. It's nice to see a 10-year-old game, essentially, that's being supported. In the end, Tales of Vesperia is awesome. It's still a great game, but not for the reasons that I remember. The battle system has a huge learning curve and the visuals aren't the best. The audio, pretty solid. Um, the main thing is you could definitely tell that this is a 10 year old game. What really kept me going through though, was the story. The story, the great character growth and excellent value proposition. If you're a fan of JRPGs or Tales games, this is easily a no brainer. I'd highly recommend it. And I'd say it's one of the better RPGs on the Switch. Oh, and I didn't mention this earlier, but the Definitive Edition includes DLC that was previously only released in Japan. This includes two new playable characters and a bunch of other stuff, but it's all woven so naturally into the story that I didn't really know what was new content and what wasn't. Another thing that totally deserves to be mentioned is that this game is co-op. You could have your buddy take over another party member to join you in battle. I didn't have the chance to experience this, so I can't comment on it. But yeah, totally recommend Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition. I don't know what I would score it if I had to give it a number. I'd say probably a solid 8 or 9 out of 10. What a thrill. Well, this was a really long video, and I appreciate you guys for sticking it out and waiting for this. I think I covered everything I wanted to, and overall, I really did enjoy the game. I did get a copy of this game sent to me by Bandai Namco and Screenwave, but. They sent it the day that my pre-order came through. Oops. Anyway, <laughs> let me know what you thought down in the comments below and how Vesperia holds up to other Tales games. I've always wanted to get into the series and, you know, I got a lot of fond memories of Symphonia, but it's a little daunting, to be honest, because these games are so freaking long. Uh, let me know what your favorite Tales game is down in the comments below. All right, I'll see you guys later. Peace. With darkness and silence through the night What a thrill